Kia ora e hoa mā, um, ke te whakarongo koutou ki Arrow FM, your community access radio programme, and why are you interrupting some perfectly good music, Michael? Because we have a guest in the studio, and I'm pleased to say good afternoon to Sasha. Hello. Hello. S- Thank you so much for having me. Sasha Borisenko is with us today, and she's with us all day, come from the, uh, the capital, and she is the new coordinator for Access Media right across the country. So she's a woman at the top. Have I expressed that adequately, Sasha? Oh, probably too adequately. Now pro- oh, my head will be so big I won't be able to wear hats. So, <laughs> so obviously we felt that we needed you um, because a lot of people... Uh, are associated with Access Radio across the country, but perhaps there are far more people that can be reached and educated about what we are. So we searched around and found you. What? How do you see the job? What is it you're trying to achieve? Mm. Well, I think I've got a background in journalism and law, and I've obviously been involved in the media for the last decade. And I think throughout that entire time, I had very little to do with access media as a sector. And I think coming into this, I think there's um, a misconception around um, what we are. And similarly, we're almost considered so niche to the point where the mass population doesn't know who we are or what we're about, which is not necessarily a problem. I mean, you know, as an industry, it's reflecting the community that you're in, and that's predominantly its purpose. But, you know, I guess from a branding perspective or a marketing perspective, it wouldn't hurt for us to kind of lift our game in that area, I think. I agree with you and I'm so pleased that somebody with your background and personality and skills and all the rest of that is here to help us lift our game. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because um, we need to lift our game so that all sorts of people, including perhaps people in important governmental positions, etc., know about us. Yet we already know that we're doing an important social job and that it is crucial for many people out there. So why do you think we need to improve in that area? Well, I think, you know, to compare it, it's apples and oranges. You know, you can't compare, say, community radio uh, with commercial radio. I mean, the the purpose and objectives are completely different, but they're both a part of a landscape where... I think access media could be included. So, for example, if you've got a big ministry and you've got a communications manager, you know, they'll have a portfolio of when they're distributing money for um, public relations or PR sort of purposes. And, you know, they'll say, okay, we need to be on this commercial radio station, uh, these newspapers, these things, this, these things. And I, and I don't think they've, um, we've been considered to be even part of that plan. No. But from a public service point of view, it's important f- because of that reach. And and on that note, I think there's a paradigm shift where media has been obsessed with the loudest voice, which isn't necessarily reflective of, you know, th- the consensus or representative of the population. But now when diversity is in vogue, it means that we've got more of a... Well, I guess it's more palatable, Mm. you know, access media, what it's about. It's funny, Mm. isn't it, that yes, it is in vogue, Mm. but it's always been important. Totally. Yeah. Totally. But but we're in strike while the iron's hot territory. Yes. And I think, you know, again, you can't really compare, you know, commercial with, um, well, probably a, a better example would be, say, RNZ with... Um, access media because of course you know RNZ it's filtered voices through journalists unless of course it's those insight programs but then you know you've got that editing process and you know filtered through various lenses which of course it serves its very own purpose and that's really important to have that you know easily digestible information that journalists break down for the masses etc but 
this is one step further, which is, you know, for you, by you, and about you. So, again, it's that public service thing, but it's kind of a model that hasn't been given that much attention from a funding point of view, but it should be. Mm. And, uh, look, to be fair, we do receive uh, Mm. a fair amount of funding from New Zealand on air, but I know as a manager that we scrabble about to get the rest. And it's perhaps always slightly less than we need, but we make do anyway. Um, I wouldn't characterise us as, as I'm saying, I, I wouldn't, uh, as, as uh, focused on the money. But of course, because we know the crucial social function that's to be achieved here, you can't do it on the smell of an oily rag, although sometimes we've done it on the smell of a photograph of a drawing of an oily (laughs) rag but nonetheless it's it's about our communities and however we can get that out we will and we have been doing it for many years but i'm so pleased that you can help the public at large understand what it is that we do and perhaps some of the people who can help us out too Totally. And I think it's just changing that mindset where, you know, rather than thinking of access media as a media platform, I think we should really be thinking about it um, as if it's a public service. So, you know, like DHBs, like entities that offer services to the community, whether it's social services or whatnot, you know, in order for those services to function, they need, you know, that infrastructure to, to do its job so yeah it's yeah I guess it's just kind of that whole paradigm shift um I mean if I were to compare it to something else you know most businesses you've got a top-down hierarchy you know and that's just the way it is but then you've got some businesses that are what would you call that um uh, flat you know where it's more collaborative everyone's considered on equal footing you know, you just can't compare the two because they're two different worlds. No, and and there's no um, value judgment implied in that. Like totally. Commercial radio does what they do very well. Mm. National radio, RNZ, uh, very important community service done there. We're just different in what mm. we do. So given that kind of model, is it a job that you are enjoying and that you think you will enjoy? Oh, I think, you know... I sound passionate and I sound almost like I'm a a communist, but, you know, coming from a legal and journalism background, I think I fundamentally believe in what this is about. So, you know, in terms of accountability, the fourth estate, that's why we entered journalism. And my legal affiliations, I guess my thinking was, okay, you've got this thing that's fundamentally important that affects everyone and yet only a small part of the population can actually understand or interpret what's going on. So I kind of went into journalism thinking, okay, let's break it down so it's truly accessible. Hmm. Um, But then, of course, it's going through my own lens and my lack of understanding and and whatnot. So I kind of already realised that there were some flaws in my own thinking of the model and then when I was introduced to access media I thought oh wow this is truly something that's incredible Mm. what you do when you're not being uh, our representative and what you have done in the past though is not to be sneezed at tell us a bit you you know you've been an investigative journalist still are what are some of the things that you've worked on that you felt really good about oh gosh I mean I think I think if you journalism journalism is definitely for people who are curious or nosy, and I'm the biggest nosy Parker in the world. Yeah. And you know, the perks of the job, and you you know what the gossip is, and that's of course hilarious. <laughs> um, I mean, I've done some stuff in a, in the legal landscape around sexual assault, um, and yeah, and, and now I've got a, I've got a column in the Herald. It's very niche. It's a legal column. Um, but yeah, I've always loved journalism, simply because the people you meet, the variety, um, I quite like the nature of writing. I thought I would go into broadcasting, and I went into radio first, but I quite like the, the it's like a puzzle, right? So, you know, yeah, just the nature of the work I find quite stimulating. You talk to one person, you get one side of the story, you talk to another, and then you're trying to find where's the angle, and then you fit it all together, and then you've got this product. And what's you feel really proud of your work, but also what's really um, 
satisfying about journalism is once it's done, it's done. You know, yeah. <laughs> you finish for the day, that's it. You yeah. know, and then a new thing. Filtered though it may be through you and your mm. perspective, it's nonetheless part of the job to present the public with the best balanced uh, look at a particular situation. So it's not, it's not all about your ego or, or your perspective. It's to do with the truth, I guess. Totally, and in the, you know, in the the case of say, sexual assault, right? I've had interesting conversations with my colleagues and friends around, you know, if this is a sensitive topic, and essentially it's there is an element of profit from someone's trauma right so is there an argument to suggest that maybe a journalist shouldn't have a byline you know no, I see. Yeah. because it's really important for it to be said but then again on the flip side you know you, we all come from various standpoints and belief systems and lenses and biases and you know whatever so it kind of is important to have that byline so that there is that accountability but i don't know mm. it's something i'm constantly grappling with well i can see what you're saying about a byline in that sense but another aspect of it is if you've got a a bit of a bit of background people mm. have got to know your work it's not it's it's also they know the degree to which they can trust what you're saying so a yes. byline is actually part of the verifying of the truth of something yes and i think there are different forms of journalism um i had a stint where i was really fortunate enough to contribute to the new york times and that was a very very with the um Ficari volcano eruption mm. um which it was an amazing opportunity, but obviously in dire, horrific circumstances. But their form of reporting is so vastly different to what yeah. I've ex experienced in New Zealand. So, unlike you know, you you go, <laughs> you go to an event and essentially you get as many voices as you can and you you bleed them dry because you are often in a very, um, you've got short timelines and whatnot, and so you're just trying to scrap everything together. The New York Times, what they do is, well, in this circumstance, you know, I was given it. Okay, we're going to look at the, um, we're going to look at the tourism aspect. So, talk to as many people as possible, and essentially you had a Google Doc sheet where you're. I did something crazy like twenty interviews one day, mm. and rather than you finding the angle, it's done overseas because they're the experts in terms of language and and writing and yeah. Uh, Really? Yeah, so it was more of a producing type of I see, yeah, yeah. Experience. A wrangling of, of, of all the sources. Yes. And then yeah. they put house style on it almost. Yeah, and the, yeah, but I think whereas New Zealand common practice would be, you know, three voices per story, this is you get as many as possible. And, mm. you know, of those 20 interviews, you might only get one quote. Yeah. You know, it's that, that, that pursuit of uh, neutrality and is just so extreme. And for every fact, you have to verify it by three sources. It must be very difficult as a writer because you, you, when you're putting together a piece, you feel that, that you have moulded it in terms of balance perspective etc and as soon as you alter that then the whole thing's like a seesaw and it tips you have to trust those people oh totally and i mean i would never consider myself a writer ever just i think from the get-go no it's always been about interviews yeah you know if you can solicit that and you know that's what i love about it. i mean you must feel the same you have a really good interview and you just you get that golden nugget there's nothing like it yeah. um and I think after years of being in print and whatnot, you start to realise your ego gets stripped away because you just get trodden on all the time, you know, yeah. <laughs> whether yeah. it's the public or whatever. And I think more often than not, I'm the first, if someone says I can make it better like this, absolutely, you're right, <laughs> you know. Well, good on you, because that's not easy to give up. Yeah. I, I, I read an article of yours that was in Al Jazeera, too. So mm. you have... Do you find the experience again of writing for them different again from the New Zealand model? And the, yes. Yeah. That, I mean, the Al Jazeera experience is um, more similar to experiences I've had in New Zealand. Mm. Um, 
But then I, I honestly believe it should, should never be with journalism. But again, I come from a, an interview background. Yeah. The interview should speak for themselves. Like I would never go, and this is totally different for everyone, yeah. um, but I would never go into a story thinking this is my angle. You know, I've done my research, this is my angle. I would go in pretty blind, and some may say naive, th- and, you know, have the interview, and then the article would shape itself, Yeah. the more organic approach. But I don't know whether that's a good thing or not. Well, I've heard, a, I, uh, I did a series about migrant taxi drivers, yes. and basically, in each case, they just talked for 90 minutes. But I had to get it down to 30, and I was very aware that anything i took out anything i shaped and molded i had their integrity at stake and therefore my job was always to keep exposing who they were despite the fact that large bits were chucked out and also might have been put in different places and juxtaposed and all the rest of that and i was aware sometimes i'd edit it a bit together and go oh that's not who they are mm. and you come back to that but if I then had to give it to somebody else to edit who hadn't gone through that whole experience that I've gone, they might not know who that person was and end up misrepresenting them. So that makes it hard. Totally. And I think that's an, a, a common issue that every single journalist and outlet faces. And I think that's probably why this whole fake news thing yeah. is a thing. Because, you know, with declining commercial avenues... <laughs> Um, and more pressure to produce um, at, a, at a faster rate, I think misrepresentation does happen more frequently. Yeah. And yet on the other side, when, when the news media are accused of being fake, I still think at heart, mm. even the ones that we might not be that sympathetic towards, they are trying to present the facts and the truth. Totally. There might be a few egos that get in the way at times, but that is what they're trying to do. And I think the undermining of the news media by you-know-who and supporters is an enormously dangerous uh, new factor, you know, that we're dealing with. Yeah. I mean, what did they say? Journalism is history now. You yeah. know, it's recording history now. And if, if, if that's threatened, then, I mean... Yeah. Uh, yeah, and and uh, regimes of various sorts have always targeted hmm. writers, journalists, the media first of all. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, if you look at this, you, you know who? Um, I mean, at what point th- this person has no scruple in the sense that even undermining the rule of law, mm. you know, or the constitution in terms of democracy so i mean it's a it's a floodgate you or a slippery slope if you undermine the fourth estate you, you know we, yeah that's right so whatever quarrels we might have mm. on on a minor basis mm. the existence of the fourth estate is absolutely crucial to totally us. um yeah what is it um there are four principles it's um the court uh Court of last resort, um, something about accountability. I don't know. I can't remember. But there, there are four major things. But yeah. Anyway. Sounds like me when I go to the supermarket and I'm supposed <laughs> to buy three things, and I come back with five things, none of which were on my own <laughs> initial list. But I know exactly what you're talking about, and I don't even know what a state access radio is first second third fourth fifth whatever the original <laughs> <laughs> but it's a different one again isn't mm. it and um because we're talking about people who are not professionally trained journalists or, or whatever then what they are presenting is their truth which is still a truth it might not have been through some of the rigorous um processes that a journalist goes through but it's still it's still their truth inside, and the more that gets shaped, the more we end up with a society. It's just that simple fact that if, as soon as we understand you and your language, it becomes impossible for us to discriminate against you. Because totally. we know who you are. Totally. 
I mean, it's the pursuit of equity and equality, right? Mm. And from a very basic fundamental level, it's the idea of social mobility. I mean, having a platform where you get to express yourself is something quite beautiful. And I think it's an opportunity that very few people have. And if they do, I think they should know about it. Well, that's right. <laughs> and they have that, uh, although as a percentage of the population, they're, they're not a not as many of them are being represented as could be hmm. and uh, we'd like to offer that opportunity to absolutely anybody too right well thank you for helping us do that sasha and uh i'll go now you can get back to your music we'll go it's been a pleasure chatting with you you too and uh i said what more can i say except goodbye <laughs>